Joining me today is an author, the editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research, as well as a senior fellow at the Austrian Economic Center. Jeffrey Tucker, welcome to the Rubin Report. Thanks for having me, good to be here. I almost wore the same bow tie, my friend. Really? I should have brought one extra there, for you. <laughs> that, yeah. that would have been <laughs> we nice. We can work on this. <laughs> All right, there's a ton I want to talk to you oh, about. Yeah. You're, you're sort of uh, one of these people that are right around all of the topics that I'm mm. talking about, from yeah. freedom and liberty and free speech mm. and the battle between the left and the right and all that. But your new book, and I want to get the title absolutely correct, Right Wing Collectivism, The Other Threat to Liberty. I thought that would be the spot for us to kick this off because most of the people watching the show know that I've mostly focused on sure, the left. Sure. That sure. was my home, sure. I was a progressive, I've woken up to what I sure. think real liberalism is, obviously, and that has nothing to do with the modern left. But sometimes people say, Dave, you don't critique the right enough. So let's well, dive know, what's, in. What's interesting about that, talk about too, right. is that so often the left and the right are not as distinguishable as they, they seem to be. For, for example, uh, the, the, this, this trade stuff, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump basically agree. Yeah. You know, how do you account for that? And, and now we, you see all the celebration of the working classes, you know, you're gonna get again, uh, the Trumpian right agreeing with uh, Bernie Sanders on, on that. Uh, the left is ever more trendy nationalist in its immigration policies, for example. That didn't used to be the case. So how, how is the left well, nationalist in immigration? Well, policies? like Bernie Sanders complained that free, free immigration is, is a, Coke, a Coke industry's plot, uh -huh. basically to provide the capitalist class cheap workers, for example. Now, that, you would have never found anybody on the left 20 years ago saying that. But, but now, you, now it's happening. You know, the, 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 the hatred of, the, of, of commerce and, and the, the merchant class is so intense now that if a luxury resort in, um, in Florida wants to hire some, some immigrants uh, to work for them, then the left is saying, oh, no, this is, this is terrible because this, cap this is capitalism at work. So you're starting to see this strange blending the left and the right have different cultural pitches, uh, uh, different appeals, different constituencies, but they both have this this agenda that's, that boils down to the, to the use of power. Is this a little bit of just what people refer to as the horseshoe theory, that the more that the sides have become sort of extreme, that they're oddly that, that coming may be, to That coalesce? may be right. I've heard this, this horseshoe theory. I tend to think it's a little bit superficial. I mean, I look at it a little bit more historically. And you see, since, uh, since liberalism was born in the world in the 18th century, really high Middle Ages, but when the revolt against liberalism began in the early 19th century, right, too much change, too much wealth, the wrong people are getting rich, there's not enough control, what are we going to do about our religion, our language, our race? You know, this, the revolt began to grow from about the 1820s and, and intensified and spread. Uh, to the United States, uh, Britain really began to take root in continental Europe. There, there took two forms. There was a, a left form and a right form. And in each country, they took, they took on different iterations, different names, you know. So, so in Britain, you had the Tories, then you had the Lab Labor Party. They both wanted to use the state for their own purposes. Then you always had the opposition party, which was the liberals, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that's the way it's fleshed out itself in country after country. The liberal party, has always been the people said, why don't we just let society be, let people live their lives. Let them choose a religion of their own, of their own choice. If they don't hurt anybody, it's not a problem. Let's have free speech. Let's have um, universal rights. Let's have rights for, let's, let's get rid of slavery. Let's have rights, uh, acknowledge the, the existence of women's rights, uh, equality of freedom for everybody. Leave everybody alone. That's the liberal position. That's a pretty, Good position. It's a, it's a it's a beautiful position, and it's and it's what I favor. It's what I think. It's what built civilization. Coming out of the religious wars of the High Middle Ages, we discovered this idea of freedom. We tried it. It worked, but there's but there's a there's always been a revolt brewing against it. A resentment, a resentment against it, a get resentment against the commercial class, too much change, too much wealth, the wrong people getting wealthy, we're not controlling demographics well enough, there's not enough equality, whatever the thing is, it takes different forms in different countries and in different times and different places, but ultimately the right and the left are ideologies of control and power, and liberalism has always been the alternative to that. So, so we keep having to rediscover this again and again in every generation. Yeah, well, that's why 
now I'm so happy that there is, as you said to me right before we started, the phrase classical liberalism yeah. is coming back. You know what I mean? You yeah. hear it on TV every now and again. I yeah. like to think that maybe I had a little something to do with it, you know? And, and it, to, me, to me, it is the only current antidote to the problems that we have. Either the, the more state power that the democratic socialists want as they've sort of ransacked their own party and, and purged all of the liberals. That's and true. it's also the antidote for all of the people. If you think Trump is all of the horrible things that people say about him all the time, what's the antidote? The antidote isn't to get somebody else in that has More that power. much power. Yeah. The antidote obviously is to take power away from that. That's what liberalism is. Well, and I, my hope is that, that there are the good people on the left, the center of the left, that are looking at the, the emergence of the Trump problem uh, will reconsider. Uh, the uses of power and the executive state and why do we build this gigantic machinery of the total state if it's so vulnerable to being captured by our enemies, right? <laughs> right, that's, the, that's the, the real question that yeah. we're at right now. If you believe this thing has been captured by the Russians or whatever it is, it's like, yeah. well, yeah. Okay, you're yeah. kind of answering your own question. So, so I hope that we can we can rekindle a kind of a new resurgence. I do have to credit you and, and Jordan Peterson for this I mean, I've been working at it for about 10 years to try to bring back this, the, not just the term liberal, but the, but the concept of liberalism um, to, to public life. And, uh, but it's been difficult because, because, because we do have this state that creates a kind of moral and intellectual and ideological hazard. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to control it. And, and now that we, we built it over the last hundred years, this, this, this total state of massive taxes, regulations, interventions, uh, running people's lives, everybody's trying to get hold of it and grab it and beat up their enemies. And it's a problem. It's a serious problem. So when people say to me, and we've discussed this on the show a bunch of times before, and I've dress, addressed this in several forums, when people say to me, wait a minute, when, you're, when you say you're a classical liberal and you talk about laissez-faire economics and getting the government out of the way and all those things, really this is just a repackaged libertarianism or you're just afraid to say that you're a conservative because it's still not cool or something like that. Yeah. Is, is there, how, how would you define the difference between, say, a classical liberal and a libertarian. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that because yeah. uh, because after World War II, uh, these neologisms, these new terms came along. Uh, one was conservatism. It wasn't really used before the early 1950s. Russell Kirk's book called um, uh, The Mindset of a Conservative, something like that. Conservative Mind, I think is what it was called. And libertarianism was, uh, again, uh, first used in about 1957. Hmm. Um, by the translator of uh, the works of Bastiat. The problem was the term liberal had been captured, you know, by the New Dealers mm -hmm. as early as 1933, once they acquiesced to the idea of the corporate of a state and were blaming the Great Depression on capitalism. Um, that became a problem for liberalism. They kept the term liberalism but they were no longer liberal. Because actually. they were suddenly for big government. They were for big government and, and even worse, the corporate state. And actually we can just be more blunt about it and say that back in the 1930s, this, this, this ideology had a name and the name was fascism, yeah, okay? Yeah. So, so they caved, right? I mean, in the New York Times in 1933, the New York Times Magazine was celebrating the great pref Professor Mussolini and how he and FDR shared a vision for the planned economy. So that's the world we were living in back then. So we, we lost the term liberal. After World War II, there was an attempt to, to just speak a language and, to, and to, to describe who we are. And on one hand, you had this new thing called conservatism. And they, they, they kind of sampled some of this Tory, Tory-like nostalgia for the past, a little bit of revanchism, you know, let's mm -hmm. recapture what we've lost. Then on the other hand, you had the genuine liberals, and they coined the term libertarianism, which had been sitting on the shelf since the late 19th century. Now, most of the people who called themselves libertarians in the late 19th century America and England were anarchist socialists, but nobody had bothered with the term for decades and decades. So Dean Russell said, well, nobody's using that word. Why don't we use it? And that was closer to the truth of what they were, it, in, it, in effect. Right? Well, what was interesting about that is, as Dean Russell described it in his 1957 article, it was a synonym for what was once called liberal. Right. He didn't think it was a, 
a tweak or an improvement or a distillation or a refinement or a, a new dogmatic way of describing liberalism, he thought it was liberalism. So I need, so, I need to read that because that yeah. I mean that's how I feel. I don't if someone says to me, Dave, you're a libertarian. I don't mind that. If we need labels, I don't mind that label. I don't mind really. the label I, I, You know, we can split the difference on how much government sure should be. Used. So the problem, I think, libertarianism as a number as a term has yeah. a number of problems. One is it's a little clinical sounding and it has too many syllables and it makes yeah. you sound a <laughs> little bit awkward, and it it sounds maybe a little too canonical. You know, like we we have. A, a list of things you have to believe, you know, like th this, this, this. It's all rooted in this kind of reductionist, uh, more commonly these days, it's rooted in this kind of a, a reductionist non-aggression principle, which is a fine principle as a rule of thumb, but it's not a good, it doesn't describe the whole of life. So mm -hmm. uh, the other problem is that libertarianism is, is a new term, so it doesn't have a deep history. So we can't look back and say, oh, look, the libertarians freed the slaves. The libertarians uh, acknowledged the rights of women. The, the libertarians gave us the commercial society that built the middle class and brought dignity to the average person. You know, right. If they had existed as a party, they would have done those they things. They would have done those yeah. things. Well, I mean, it's the liberals who did that. But it's the liberals, But yeah. we changed our name, so now we can't like feel a sense of pride hmm. in our past, so it doesn't have a past. Hmm. So that's a problem. So we're, uh, libertarians tend to be de detached from their own history for that reason. And I think it's a, it's a problem, it's a word problem. The second problem is that libertarianism doesn't have a universal of usage, like whereas liberalism does. Mm -hmm. You can go to Spain, describe yourself a liberal. Brazil, there's, there's liberals. In Germany, there's liberals. Every, there's a word for liberalism in every language, and it more or less means the same thing except in the United States. Right. So, uh, so uh, if we acquiesce to this term libertarian and just wipe out our liberal history, we're cutting ourselves off both from the world and from our own history. It, it's so funny because you've just said it in a far better way than I think I've ever really laid it out, but people will say to me, Dave, stop saying you're a liberal. And I don't want to stop saying I'm a liberal. I get that I'm you fighting a, an uphill battle right now, right? I'm a, I'm a salmon swimming upstream. This is gonna be tough but I don't want to deny what is the truth just because it's, because it's tough. It's who you are, and you want, to, you want to have an ancestry. You know, you want to look back and, and see uh, the, the champions of the Medici's in, in f 15th century uh, Florence and say, I know those people, those are my people. Yeah. You know, the people who long for a world without slavery you know, in the early 19th century. The people who wanted free trade and fought hard for it. Those are our people. That's our history. I mean, we were, we were born as part of a long stream of emancipation that's been taking place for 500 years. That's our movement, our people, our history. Let's embrace it. I'm with you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> All but, right, so it, are yeah. there any of those liberals uh, part of the Democratic Party anymore. Do those I, people uh, exist? Well, anymore? strange things are happening on the left. Very strange things. And I, I'm not sure. I should pause you for one sec. I, my original question here was I wanted to do the deep dive on the right. Yeah, so we're going to get, we'll we'll get, we'll get, get, no, we we'll will get, get no, I promise talk, you we're going to get to that. Well, this is I really, a funner topic. I mean, the, yeah. the, the deep dive on the far right gets us into a very dark place. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, maybe that, all right. So maybe the whole second half will be on that. Yeah, okay. Let me just put that out there right now. That's what we'll do for the second. I'm just now getting out of my depression having finished no. my book. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our whole second half is going to be okay. what my first question was about, but yeah, let's, yeah. let's just keep going on yeah, this yeah, yeah. road for now. So, so strange things have happened to the left. Um, let's just mention the, the, the phrase cultural appropriation, for example. Now, when, when did that, the approbation of this idea of cultural appropriation came out, like, what, two, three years ago? Three, yeah. four, five? I don't know. Academia is weird. It may have been brewing for 10 years. Yeah. But when I first heard about it, I thought, that is the craziest bunch of nonsense I've ever heard. I mean, civilization is nothing but cultural appropriation. We've been doing this since, since the ninth century, you know, at the, at the uh, height of uh, the Confavincium in, in Spain, where, where Judaism and Islam and Christianity came together in this beautiful melting pot where we all learn from each other and the cultures began to blend and our religions began to change and our, our outlook on life began to, because we learn from each other. If we stay isolated in our little tribes, we're never gonna progress. And, and, and the idea that, and I don't know if it was inadvertent or what happened, I mean, we can talk about this, but 
that when, when suddenly you're told you cannot have affection for another culture and take what you find valuable and, and learn, learn for yourself and live a better life, that is very strange. They seem to think it's cultural annihilation, not cultural appropriation, right? Like they seem to yeah. think that this is something that will lead to the destruction of that culture, I, when in fact, yeah. it actually spreads the ideas yes, of yes, that yes, yes. culture, the foods, the, well, the clothing, the, the, the ideas, the, not just the They're treating things. culture as a scarce good, like it's a property, but it's not. The magic of culture, which is the same magic of ideas, is it resides in its infinite reproducibility and its malleability. This is something that the world of ideas can do that the physical world cannot do. And if we don't make that distinction, we're going to get very confused. Do you see what I mean? I, I mean, do. Like, cultures spread and they, they're infinite uh, and they can constantly change. And that's the magic and beauty of, of culture. We, we can't get that out of this glass of water, this table. Right? They're, they're, they're bound by the constraints of scarcity, but the world of ideas is, is magical. It's like a constant, constant infinite sandstorm, you know, unpredictable and, and constantly changing. And we can, we can take a, a culture for ourselves without taking it from somebody mm -hmm. else, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's reprodu reproduction. It's infinite reproduction. It's the loaves and the fishes. Isn't, isn't the beauty, too, that America has done this better than anyone perhaps in the history of the world? You, you just referenced yeah. some other points in time, but yeah. that we have taken in more cultures, and you said the phrase melting pot. I mean, that, that's what we designed and set up here the most beautiful melting pot ever. I, I lived in New York City for most of my life, most of my adult life at least, and would be on subway cars, and you were on that car with absolutely everyone, with ev know. white guys with dreadlocks and the whole thing. And I guess know. what, you may not like everybody, and you may no. not like the way this guy smells, and that person may be doing this, but we're all there, but it's and magic. we're living together. It's magic. You know, it's, it's, it really is commerce. It's because this country, elevated the commercial ethos to be the, the, the highest thing, the great ennobling factor of, 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 of human life. And it's commerce that brings people together. And we experience that every day. You know, you can, in, in a commercial setting, uh, people aren't fighting each other, they're, they're getting along. I mean, I, I find, I'm with you. I go, to, I go to a restaurant and I get served by some guy from, from uh, Pakistan. It's, it, it's a chance to meet somebody new. It's a chance to engage somebody and have a personal relationship with somebody who's serving you and you're serving them and you experience this magic of exchange. Uh, Benjamin Constant used to talk about this in, in the 1830s, how, how, how commerce brought to the world a new understanding of freedom and a new opportunity for us to find value in each other, in service of each other. And, and America just flourished in commerce, and that's why that's why we have, you know, the the, the diversity and the, and this melting pot, as you t call it, and this rich cultural life. You know, it's so funny because I'm so keenly aware of it right now. Not only because yeah. of the conversations I'm having and because people are screaming mm. about this stuff all the time, but you know, I'm on this tour with Jordan Peterson, and when I go to every airport that I go to, I 90% of the time, unless someone set a car for me, I take an Uber. And yeah. I just hop in whatever Uber That's shows so up. Right. And there is, there, there is every single type of person that looks every which way, and every color, every sexuality. And usually I talk a little bit to, to them. Yeah. It's, you know, And it's like, man, these are just people. I, I've, you know, I'm, maybe you feel the same way. Uh, you know, I, I live in Atlanta, which is just a gigantically diverse society. Mm -hmm. you know? And everywhere you go, you're bumping into people who are different from you. And, and I hang around in crypto circles in Atlanta. I want to talk to yeah, crypto yeah. as well. And, and that, you talk about a melting pot. I mean, we're all together. And there, we all consider each other our people, you know, just because we all love crypto. And it has nothing to do with, with race. You can appreciate racial differences, with, but also see value in everybody and, and hope they can see value in you. You can come together. It doesn't mean that we have to be egalitarian or, or deny differences. It means that we find strength in our heterogeneity. And, and that's... That makes for a beautiful and exciting life. Uh, one of the strangest things that's happening now, you know, with the rise of the alt-right in response 
to the failures and, and strangeness of the left is this new celebration of homogeneity mm -hmm. as if, oh, we need to live in a unitary racial state, you know, where we all speak the same language or all uh, have the same religion. So that strikes me as aesthetically very boring. And I don't, I don't even recognize what that world would, would look like and feel like. And it doesn't appeal to me in the slightest bit. Yeah. Minority was built out of the out of the diversity that grows out of commerce. And the commerce is the key, because that's what helps us invest in each other. You know, Adam Smith said this about the division of labor, right? It's like, what causes wealth? The division of labor. How big can that be? It should be as big as possible. The wider the division of labor, the more people you include in the great project of, of building commercial life and production, the wealthier we're all going to be together. And I just, I love that vision. So when we talk about capitalism on this show, I'll, every now and again, I jump in the comment section or I see what people say on Twitter, if I have you know, some of the, the Ayn Rand people on or just some of the people that are not for regulation at all and just let the economy go and see what happens. There's always a certain amount of people that say, okay, that all sounds well and good, but then the rich just keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer and Jeff Bezos shouldn't have you know, $20 trillion or whatever he has right now or the rest of it. What, what's the... What's the boilerplate answer uh, well, to why you I believe that? I get frustrated that to be with those kind of cliches because they've been they've been around for 150 years and they've never been true. I mean, they, they weren't true in Marx's time, and everybody you know, quickly recognized that. You know, by the late 19th century, uh, in America, we had we had built the most prosperous economy in the world by far, by far, by far. Growing incomes, longer lives, healthier people, more opportunities for everybody. People are moving to the cities. Everybody's benefiting from capitalism. That's been going on for such a long time. And yet, here we are in 2018, and we're still recycling these, these Victorian-era <laughs> cliches about capitalism. I don't understand it. What, what do you think capitalism then screwed up if, if only just a marketing piece of it or something, where right now you sense... And, and I believe that it will not win, but yeah. that, that, it, that it somehow doesn't seem cool to be for capitalism, at least with yeah, young people. Yeah, that does seem to be the, the, the change. Maybe it's in the name, and I don't, I don't even have a problem not using the, the word capitalism. I mean, I, you, you probably have the same view towards this. I will speak the language that, that you can understand. Mm -hmm. And if, if I want to rebrand uh, capitalism as liberalism, which it probably should be, actually, liberal liberalism, then I'm, I'm glad to talk about that. Uh, at the same time, I kind of like the term capitalism. Mm -hmm. I, I have no problem with the term yeah. capitalism. Because, because it, it really does underscore a really important point that without private property and the, in the, in ownership of the means of production, you can't have a complex uh, production structures and you can't hire more people, you can't, you can't build great things, you can't have great cities, you can't improve people's lives. So what are the things that you think government should do? Well, I think of lots of kinds of rules that we should have, um, but I'm not a fan of governments in general. If there was some way that you could have, you know, an old-fashioned liberal state, you know, that was really minded its own business and um, kept kept civil war from happening, for example, you know, kept conflict, that kind of mass conflict, um, then that would be a, probably a good a good thing. Um, state is not very good at that, so um, I, I think, I mean, I've got, I've got the mind of an anarchist, essentially. I, I trust, <laughs> you know, I trust the chaos of, of spontaneous human action much more than any kind of, of, of imposition. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I am, at the same time, I do like the writings of the old liberals. You know, they, they imagine that the state should do something to keep something like a order in life keep civil war from happening, to keep people from killing each other, uh, terrible things like that. But beyond that state, should just it should be laissez-faire. It should just allow commerce to flourish and, and allow, allow problems to work themselves out. I, and people don't have confidence in that anymore, but not because of any failure, but it's, it's almost like the, the ideology of power has become a kind of a modern cancer that affects, afflicts everyone. And I think we need to do something about it. Wait, can you explain that a little further? Well, it's just that once you believe that you can control the path of history and you have an end point in mind, society should look like this, mm -hmm. then you want to use every kind of tool to hammer it in place. And this is, this is what I call right and left-wing Hegelianism, essentially. And it's a, it's a grave temptation. 
And so we built this, like we said at the outset, and we built this gigantic machinery we call the state, this total state, and it controls so much wealth and so much power and so much rest with, with uh, get, getting, you know, gaining access to it that it's just a kind of a constant moral hazard for everybody. Like, give, give me that state, and I'll make it do the right things. Right, so for the people on either side of this, whether you're on the left and, and you want to help those that you deem oppressed more, right. or people with less, when I believe their intentions to be good, even if their right. methodology, I think, generally is not good, or you're people on the right that want less of a state, but, you know, you're just on either side of this thing. How much do you think the, the system itself can move without breaking? Because what I think I'm noticing now is that there's a certain amount of people that really just want to trash the whole thing. And I do see this certainly more on the left right now because they're not in power. Mm. That there's this growing thing, uh, and this is why they're so into Marxism and all this stuff now. It's like, let's just trash the whole freaking thing and forget all the goodness that this has done. And they're doing it from their iPhones and you know, their the sense China, of, the, their the sense of irony is not great. But yeah, is there, is the there just a- The capitalist system, you mean. Right, yeah. is there just a certain amount that a, a system that's basically good can move before it snaps. And I, I would suspect that that's not much either way, really. Uh, you mean the, the commercial structure right now, or, com or the lives are capitalist structures, yeah. or you mean the state? Um, you know, what I see actually happening is the innovation is taking place so quickly, it's actually outrunning the, uh, the capacity of government to control it. And I think that's, that's really exciting. If I was gonna look at one point of hope in the world, is that the, the market mm -hmm. and the entrepreneurial innovative sectors of life, from the app economy to the gig economy to now with, with blockchain technology and everything is moving so quickly that states can't, can't even keep up. Right, so I'm there with you on that yeah, because and I- that's I, glorious. I, I, I'm very happy about that. I I'm, see that because it's, to me, it's like, wh how are people listening to all of these conversations, all of these podcasts that are out there and communicating mm -hmm. about them so quickly? And it's like the government can't, uh, it can't keep up with all yeah. of that. The change can't because people are lighting up all the time now in a much faster way. And I think we're changing in a much more rapid way. And I think that's actually really cool. There's a danger to it because yeah. we could just spin out of control and do all sorts of awful things. but. What you said? Well, what did you say before about the general inertia of people or something? That the, the general left to their own ways of figuring things out. They'll figure it out, and, and you know, uh, there's a reason why our politics seem reactionary on the left and the right. Everyone's trying to bring back something. There's a, there's a nostalgia on the left and a nostalgia on the right, and they're trying to use the state to hold us back. Like, and, and it, whatever, it's a vision of the, is it the 60s, is it, is it the 70s, is it pre-industrial revolution? You know, is it some Rousseauian fantasy of perfect <laughs> equality, you know, that, that the left might imagine, or, or, or the right uh, thinking about, you know, a world of high tariffs of the 1880s or 90s, or, but everyone's looking back to something they want to create, and it's, there's a real fear of the fu future on the left and the right. And it's a future without control. It's a future where we're able to travel where we want to, download the apps we want to, invent what we want to, work by ourselves, live where we want to live, be d digital nomads, tr you know, travel around, do what we want. This, this world without control. That's so control, cool. That's, that's, so that's cool. not <laughs> what people should be fearing. People, everyone should be going, holy cow, this is the freest, coolest thing ever. That's the world I want to live in. I want to that that obviously is why you're so attracted to Bitcoin also, right, and crypto in sure, general. Sh sure, Because sure. it's sort of the, the backbone for well, a lot of this, Well, I right? mean, if you think about it, I mean, we've waited our whole lives, and actually generations of great intellectuals have lived, uh, lived and died for so long, wanting something like a private currency that, that emerged privately, that operates without financial intermediaries, that the government is not controlling, that's global, that doesn't, it's not restrained by currency zones, that anyone could have access to. You know, a true democratic technology like Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, that is just a dream come true. That is, is glorious. That's why I write about it all the time and talk about it all the time. It is, it is the alt-right killer. It is the alt-left killer. It's, it's the thing that's going to ultimately, I think, um, protect us from these wicked ideologies that are constantly trying to control our lives.
Because basically, at some point, one of these ideologies is going to get too much control of, of the state. Well, I and hope of they the just fight with system. each other forever. I mean, you know, one of the things that, that, when I think about this sometimes, when you get depressed about the divisions in our public life and the way people are tearing, tearing each other apart and the way you open up the newspaper and this, you, you can barely even read it anymore. Yeah. You know, the news is what now? Uh, uh, yeah, news. I know, I know. But it's like down to Trump, you know, then it's like, you know, up with Trump, you know, and it's just, it's just this forever debate. And the one thing that I think maybe we should not be entirely unhappy about this is if you look back at history, when, when freedom emerges out of the high Middle Ages, it wasn't because any one great intellectual or any one great state or any one great power said, hey, let's let everybody be free. It was because there were so many competitors for power that they, nobody could, could gain the monopoly. Mm -hmm. It was the church. It was the, 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 the nation state. It was the, the, the locality. It was the monarchical state, uh, the, the landed aristocracy, you know, the, the, the rising merchant class. You know. So there are all these independent power centers strewn throughout European society, and nobody could get, get access to the final singular, singular control. No unitary power. And so that fight that took place among so many disparate powers actually led to a kind of flourishing of freedom. So, you know, in a sense, the fight between the left and the right today is not the worst thing if they just keep fighting and leave the rest of us alone. <laughs> right, right, right. All right, so before... I, I don't know where we're going to be that lucky, but... <laughs> okay, so before we spend the whole second half on the question that I started this whole thing with, yeah. do the people who want freedom, basically, and a light touch of government, are they always at a disadvantage because there's another set of people who will always use the apparatus against well, them, where if they're being true to themselves, they won't use the power to stifle other people it, or all sorts of other things. So in an odd way, our ideas are at a disadvantage. They always have been. We've always been a kind of minority, though. Even, again, over the last two or three hundred years of political history, we've always been that, that third way, that spy minority. But we had, we had rare victories, but big ones, you know, like the end of slavery you know, um, was just glorious. I mean, the protection of the great banking empires of Europe from, from the populist rabble, you know, from the, from the preachers who wanted to, to destroy it. There were these great victories, uh, the victory of free trade, you know? But, but we've won every once in a while, and it always changed the world. Because once you have a little bit of freedom, just a little bit, it just blows up, and it becomes awesome, and it's amazing, and it, and it, and it kills power because it's so powerful and so wonderful. But it's worth fighting for. And we've always fought mainly through ideas, not through armies, not through, through guns and controlling states. It's always been the philosophical awesomeness of this position. It's been the celebration of the common man, uh, uh, the celebration of, of wealth, uh, the, the love of, of consumerism and commercial life, the coming together of people, the ennoblement of people, the, the, the right of, of travel, uh, the right of association, and to do what you want, to have as many children as you want, to, to educate your kids the way you want to. That, these kinds of principles are compelling, and they've always led to victory for liberals, despite the pressure from the other two sides. And I think it's, I think it's gonna be our future, I do. Let's shift. Let's talk about the scary right. Are you ready? I tried to do this uh, we, with we you. Did, we did the happy stuff first. <laughs> uh, now we're going to plunge. Look, you know, Dave, when I began to research this thing, I probably ended up reading about 200 books on this topic wow. in the end. And, and I'm a happy guy. I like happy things. I like technology. I, I'm an optimistic guy. But this really put me in a dark place uh, digging through this history. Uh, from, from Hegel, essentially, up to Julius Caesar Evola and the, and the post-war Nazi uh, movement, and realizing that there was an intellectual strain that stretched over all of these years, essentially. Okay, so let, let's go back. 200 years, yeah. So let's go back 200 years. When you talk about right-wing collectivism, yeah because I think most of my audience now understands what left-wing collectivism is, because that's what we've got right now, right. very in a very strong way. Talk to me about right-wing collectivism. Okay, Dave, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, I, I love Ludovic Mises, I think he was a genius, right? And I thought I'd read all of his works, but in, there is a transcript of a lecture he gave in 1956 at the San Francisco Public Library, and he had about three sentences in there that just knocked me over, and I couldn't believe it, because it explains so much. He says something like this, and he's speaking casually, right? He says, Hegel ruined German philosophy for a century. 
uh, his original followers became uh, b believed that all of history would end in the Prussian state and the Prussian church having all power and the end of indiv individualism. They became the right Hegelians that became the Nazis. His, the dissidents of, this, uh, of the right Hegelians became the left Hegelians. They wanted a universal transformation of humanity and a, and a historical drive to, to something other than the commercial society. They became the Marxists. And, uh, and the communists. And he said that that's it. It's left-right Hegelianism, and that explains pretty much all the political history. And I, I, I closed that, and I thought, hmm. that explains more than practically any other book I've ever read. And so I began to, began to explore this. I understood the left Hegelianism. I, I understood Marxism. I mm -hmm. mean, those were, those were our professors, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're annoying. Uh, but what I did not understand was the right Hegelianism and what that what that tradition looks like. It's the the throne and altar, uh, this this historicist view that the nation should constitute its own unit of profound integrity uh, that 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 is more important than the, than the individual, and that commercial society was too chaotic, that it that that it was leading us giving us the wrong kind of progress, that it was flattening out the hierarchies that we need to have an orderly life, right? This is, this is the right Hegelian pitch that ultimately by mid 20th century becomes this very dangerous, dangerous movement in Europe, you know, um, that became catastrophic. Uh, but it gradually emerged from all the way from, from Hegel, because uh, this is at the, the end of um, the, the, the endless, seemingly endless uh, Franco-Prussian wars. There's this battle at the Battle of Jena that, that Germany lost. And the explanation for that was that um, it was a temporary setback, that history was going to determine that Germany would rise. Hmm. Des despite, despite the choices of individuals, history has got its wind. It's, it's like a meta-narrative that, that, that was going to override everything. Hegel himself was a theologian, by the way. Um, and, so, and so this this view began to kind of spread throughout German academia, and it was it ended up being imported to the United States through through circuitous means. But, w but one of the great theorists of the of the 1840s who and 1850s who brought this to the United States was Friedrich List, who was uh, one of the first economists to repudiate the free trade tradition of of, of the Smithian. Uh, Manchesterites, and now is celebrating the nation as a as a unit, as a productive power, uh, and and believed in tariff walls, uh, which was strange. And I've read his book, uh, but and that had a huge influence over American uh, trade policy, actually, in the late 19th century, and. Um, and it, it began to f f flow out from there. So Thomas Carlyle in, in, in Britain now uh, begins to celebrate the great man theory of history. And really we're nothing without Napoleon, without, without gigantic uh, figures that we can worship, admire, and, and, and our individuality should be subsumed within them. They act for us. Mm -hmm. They're godlike, you know. And, and, and it was Thomas Carlyle who first coined the phrase, um, uh, coined the phrase to describe eco economics as being the dismal science. And the reason he said that is that every economist he knew imagined a world without slavery. And he said, you can't have a world without slavery. That's, that's a dreadful world. Without slaves, you don't have masters, right? And we need a world with masters and slaves so we can, we can have a vision of hierarchy and greatness. Without that, we don't have greatness. So you began to see this building of this intellectual apparatus. It was not left Hegelian. It wasn't Marxist. Mm -hmm. It was actually anti-Marxist in a strange way, but it was an alternative form of collectivism. Uh, it, it began with a kind of a historicism and a celebration of nationalism with the German state. It began to grow with this, this, this alternative theory of trade that we should, we should build up tariff walls. And Carlyle with his, with his great man theory of history, and then, and then uh, Ruskin and, and Britain 
Washington with his hatred of commercial society because he believed that somehow uh, commerce was ruining quality and culture and was giving us mass production. And what we all need to be really doing is 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 uh, uh, living in guilds and and making our own stuff, you know, because we're going to destroy English life and English country life. And so so a, a full scale reactionary trend on the right began to develop. Mm -hmm. And it was really, there always a racial element to no. it? No. So that's what's interesting. I'm so glad you asked that because it comes about, first of all, through, through nationalism. Now, in the, in the early 1820s and 1830s, this, this celebration of nationalism. Now, you have to ask yourself, what is a nation? Right? What do we mean when we say nation? And, and I'm taking this, uh, a lot of this from... Um, uh, from uh, uh, an essay gave, given in 1882 by Ernst Renan, a great uh, French historian, uh, looking back at the rise of nationalism, said there's only five ways you can consider nationalism. Uh, you consider uh, the geographic definition, so we just live in the space. There's mm -hmm. a dynastic element. We can all trace our lineage back to the great mm, founders of our, our nation. There's a language theory of nationalism. We all speak the same language. There's a religious theory of nationalism. We all worship God in precisely the same way. I believe in transubstantiation. You believe in consubstantiation. We can't be part of the same mm -hmm. nation in that case, right? right? And then finally, and probably most insidiously, there was the racial, uh, the racial view. And that came along in essentially the 1860s and 1870s with a misapplication of Darwinian theory and scientific racism came along. And that swept through academia, particularly in the United States, like nothing you've ever seen. It was absolutely astonishing how much racism with orthodoxy in American academia in the 1890s. I mean, the very first monograph published by the American Econ Economic Association by a guy named, I think his name is Andre Hoffman, it was called Race Traits of the American Negro. And the first chapter just goes all in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the horror of the, of the black people, they don't have the right values, they can't, can't save money, they're just terrible, uh, shiftless and, and lazy and ghastly and uncivilizable, and now chapter two, the Jews. You know, these people, I don't know what, they've got this crazed, out of control commercial ethic. They can't stop hoarding money. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Man, they, they really went for it. Yeah, and then the third chapter three is the slops, and, and so on, and so on. The American Economic Association, you know? And then, uh, and there was essentially nothing. What, what do you think was it. happening in the, in the world there that it was taking? I'll tell you what was way. happening, Dave. Laissez faire had transformed society so dramatically that. The, the intellectuals felt that they had lost control. Now, you might think that when the world becomes massively prosperous and we suddenly have cities rising up and we've got steel that is transversing large bodies of water and we're developing the telephone and indoor electricity and, and people are living longer lives and, and so much wealth is being created that everybody would stand up and say, hooray, we found the answers. But the gatekeepers who had controlled right. everything for so long. So that's so interesting because it was a revolt. this is sort of what it feels like now to me. The gatekeepers, we've had so much success. Yeah. There's, so many, there's so many reasons yeah. right now to understand how great everything is. That book right there by Steven Pinker, Enlightenment that's Now, a great book. Is, is all about how great things are and how that's a great actually book. we are, there is less violence yeah. now and all sorts no, of wonderful and the, things. And so the revolt, you always have to be on the... But the gatekeepers you, aren't happy they when, are not when happy. the narrative the, the shifts. The intellectuals are what Deirdre McClossie calls the clarity, right? So it's, it's the, the high-end intellectuals, it's the power elite bureaucrats and the, and the public, the, the per permanent pe keepers of our civic culture, you know, it's, it's the political class. And, uh, so this is uh, sort of what, uh, for, for my audience that may be not following all this, this is sort of what the New York Times is, sort of, right? Kind like, of, yeah. maybe I shouldn't have said it so obviously, no, but yeah. like, that's kind of what it is. Like yeah. that class. The ruling class. Yeah. The ruling class. And, and they were in full-scale revolt. They, they did not like what was happening to the world in the 1880s and 90s because of the loss of control. And so the, the scientific racism came along to add to the celebration of dictatorship and, the, and, and protectionism and the new nationalism to add a very insidious element uh, which culminated in eugenics ideology. And that's when it gets very strange. And this is where, this is where the reading gets very difficult because now you're reading all the way into uh, you know, the, the, the 1910s with the works of Oswald Spengler, you know, the, the, the 
the right Hegelian German theorist that enraptured every American. You know, they were all reading his book, oh my God, The Decline of the West. We better reconstitute ourselves as a tribe or we're going to be eaten alive by, <laughs> by all the other foreigners. And then, but there's and, a strain of that that's still going on right now. Still, it, th there's nothing new. Uh, you know, like, and, and you know, the, this, this very funny book called The Passing of the Great Race by Madison Grant, uh, that was on every coffee table in, in the late uh, 19-teens and early 1920s, you know, was, was forecasting doom for the white race, you know, and he was, he was a fascinating figure because, um, you know, of course I read his book, as, as it everybody did, uh, everybody, the, Greg Gatsby makes a passing reference to it, it was that popular, huh. it was that popular, and I tell you, there's not a single alt-right racist alive today who hasn't, is not repeating those cliches that were written by Madison Grant, it's all pseudoscience, it's all just nonsense, and it's just ridiculous, embarrassing, but, but it keeps being resurrected, but here's what's interesting, he was a thoroughgoing uh, Darwinian, because you recall that Dar Darwin had two great books, The Origin of Species, the other was called The Descent of Man. Mm -hmm. And The Descent of Man had the very unfortunate paragraph in there where he regret, regrets um, the, the uh, invention of mass uh, disease killing uh, 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 cures, essentially. It's like if we keep curing people and we keep feeding uh, inferior people and, and curing disease, then, then our genetic stock is going to go down and down. You know, so, so they're all kind of playing off this little, little passage. But Madison Grant was, was not an unusual by American ex academic standards at all. They, they, this was orthodox in the 1810s and 1820s. What made Madison Grant interesting, you can look up his, his Wikipedia entry right now. Uh, if you look it up, it'll, it'll celebrate him as the, as the father of the National Park Service. Well, in the course of my research, I wanted to know what is the connection between Madison Grant's hardcore eugenics-based racism and his environmentalism? Hmm. What is the relationship there? And it's not just two people. Usually people have, have it figured out in their own heads. So I went through and read some of his works on, on the environment. It turns out that he had a master race theory of nature. And he went to the California Redwoods and he looked at these glorious, mighty trees. And he was horrified to see they were being cut down for for, for, for making coffee tables and boats and things like that. And he thought it was dysgenic to nature. Huh. So he wanted the master race, uh, the California Redwoods, to, to be protected. And that's, that, so that's why he started the National Park Service. And, wow. and now the left heralds him as, as, this great, as a, a great visionary environmentalist, but actually he was like a tree Nazi. I don't know how else you want to call it. <laughs> a tree Nazi. Yeah. It's very creepy stuff. We don't have enough Nazi labels <laughs> being thrown around. Now we're going to have tree Nazis. Yeah, he was, I'm sure that already He exists. was nuts. Uh, but, it, you know, you can just march through the history, and it gets worse and worse. And then, to me, Dave, it all, it all culminates in the works of Carl Schmitt. Uh, from the from the late 1930s and his and his amazing book called the concept of the political and if you'll give me just one quick second to explain this because yeah. because you as a liberal uh, need to read this book because it's the most passionate I would say an even competent attack on liberalism written in the 20th century now Carl Schmitt was a jurist a brilliant man and a philosopher and a hardcore Nazi Okay, he wasn't tried at Nuremberg. He escaped. I'm merely an intellectual. Okay, sure. His book, Concept of the Political, says, "What's wrong with liberalism?" I tell you, it's dull. Nothing happens. Nothing dramatic. There's nothing. Just requires no courage whatsoever. Liberalism is a life in which we all benefit from each other's presence. We all just trade with each other. What kind of life is that? Where we all just are kind of the same and like each other and hold backyard barbecues and go to baseball games and, and just get richer and live longer lives and send our kid to college. This is terrible. We need to live big, dramatic, mighty, bold, courageous, transformative lives and live in times that, 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 that are shocking, that are amazing, that make our lives worth living. That requires, above all else, politics. Liberalism imagines a world without politics that's a terrifying world. What hmm. we need is a world of politics. And, and he continues to lay it out, chapter by chapter, why we have to destroy liberalism and celebrate the concept of the political. And for him, that means having friends and having enemies, defeating your enemies and rallying around your friends. Now, who are your friends and who are your enemies? And Carl Schmitt says, at some level, it doesn't matter. 
What matters is that they exist, and the, and the state, the powerful men, will choose them for us. They will decide who our friends and our enemies are. Now, let's be clear what we mean by enemy. I just don't mean somebody you don't like. I mean the willingness to kill. There has to be the presence of real bloodshed in your time for you to have a sufficiently prescient sense of eneminess so that you'll feel the intense desire to rally around your friend, for your friends and experience that, that, that the, the awesomeness that only comes with belonging to a group. So, so he says, so but, he- But the, en the end yeah. feeling there is that you can't achieve what, uh, what the real purpose of a human is. That's right. That you can't experience whatever the, the highs of, of, of humanity of, of are. Of belongingness, essentially, and, and the life of drama, the, a big, important life, right. without being part of a kind of a, a group on the move that's slaughtering its enemies. And so we have to have the presence of, of bloodshed. So it really so, is the opposite of live and let live. It is. It's so through, the, through, through bloodshed comes life. And without, without bloodshed and death and violence and politics, then you're just going to live an, an irrelevant life, and we can't have that. So he was, in many ways, the philosophical architect of the Holocaust. Again, not a leftist, not a Marxist, although he dabbled in it. You find this from a lot of these right collectivists, the right Hegelians, that they dabbled. Guys like Werner Sombart, right? He was once a communist, who later became a Nazi. Mm. Uh, Carl Schmitt dabbled in, in leftism and then went full right. Um, and it was, in many ways, the culmination of the right Hegelian ideology in, in Carl Schmitt. So it's, it's a book worth reading and contemplating. And I would say to anybody who rejects liberalism, you know, be honest about where you're going with this. This is the, the opposite of liberalism is celebration of death in the works of Carl Schmitt. Very powerful thinker. Highly regarded, even today. Worth reading and worth reflecting on. What kind of world do you want to live in? You want to live in a, a peace with others? Or do you want to slaughter your friends, or slaughter your enemies and rally with your friends? So move me from that point, 1930s, into, of course, obviously, into yeah. Nazi Germany. Yeah, and then yeah. And then we'll, we'll so finish after, where we well, are. Now. Yeah, and, and you know, my book really does end in 1950. Not necessarily, it didn't have to, but I, I started to get really queasy about what happened after World War II. A lot of the right Hegelian movement went underground, you know, um, and, and became a kind of a, a, a quiet neo Nazi movement that never really had access to social media. They were, clearly, they weren't in academia, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, but the ideology never entirely went away. And, and it was just lying in wait. wait, waiting for the failure of the left and for the resentment of the population against the left to rise up and receive, or get a, a fevered enough pitch that it would, it would then uh, come on full force. And that's really what's happening in Europe, Russia, United States. It's an alternative form of collectivism. It's got a different flavor, a different orientation, a different kind of resentments but it still drags in this gigantic history of right Hegelian ideology, the celebration of the dick, great man dictator, the protectionism, the anti-immigration, the nativism, the nationalism that could take any one of five forms, including the racism. Um, what, and, what do you make about how now, and it's obviously largely because of the internet, it yeah. seems to be happening in so many places at once. We're seeing this unholy, it's an oddly unholy alliance it between is. the collectivist left and then that drives, I mean, it's exactly what you're saying. Then you've got this other thing yeah. that's just waiting there for these guys to go two bananas. Yeah. And then it's like, ah, oh, we got all the easy answers. Meanwhile, you have the liberals and everyone, all the, the decent 80% of us yeah. that are trying to live <clears throat> and let live. So just part, of it, part of it really comes down to this. There's a weird a sociological, cultural contradiction at the heart of social democratic leftist ideology. On one hand, they, they wanted to build gigantic institutions that are redistributatory, and we're supposed to treat each other like a big family, and we're supposed to have this homogeneous nation state. On the other hand, they're celebrating diversity and encouraging mass immigration mm -hmm. and heterogeneous populations. And guess what? Those don't really work together. So you build gigantic, gigantic states that presume sort of uh, that we're all one family. And then you throw in this, this, this diverse set of people, especially with the refugee crisis in Europe and immigration in the United States, and people are looking around going, yeah, these people aren't my family. I don't even like these people. Yeah. And yet I'm paying for them. I mean, that is a prescription. I mean, that, that blows yeah. up. I mean, that's a disaster. It's a powder keg. And so is the left and this core contradiction that they have between a welfare state on one hand and their celebration of heterogeneous populations on the other, welfare state and diversity, they don't, 
they don't work. And that basically puts us where Germany sort of is at right now, yeah. right? Where they said, okay, three million people, come on in. Now all these people are going to have to pay for you. We're not going to integrate you yeah. properly. I mean, this is not only. Now you've got the identitarian movements rising up in, in Germany and in Hungary and, of course, in, in Russia and, and, of course, the U.S. You know, so it all just kind of follows. It's, it's inevitable. The left created this. I mean, if, if after World War II we had just embraced liberalism like we should have, like we should have, we wouldn't be where we are today. But we have another chance, and that's why you're here, and that's why I'm here. We have another chance now to, to re-embrace liberal, liberal theory yeah. and, to, and to reject the left. And don't feel yourself, just because the enemy of your enemy is, is there, it doesn't mean it has to be your friend. I mean, we really do need to think of ourselves as kind of a, a dissidents from a political culture that, that rally around freedom and human rights and universal human rights and and the ennoblement of humanity, the champion of the common person, uh, the rights of everyone uh, to live freely with each other, to, to gain value from each other, and to live in peace and stop thinking of our, of our fellow human beings as possible enemies. We don't want to get drafted into this, the political world that Carl Schmitt imagined for us. As I was describing Carl Schmitt, you, you see it happening, right? Mm -hmm. That Schmittian view to slice and dice the population. Who do you like? Who do you hate? You know, who, who are your people? It's, this is not a good life. Yeah, and we feel it's it chopping away life. at both sides, right? Yeah, we do. We feel it. And so we don't, I just don't feel like we have to be part of it. I mean, as best we can, uh, let's find things we love, <laughs> you know, and go places we love, be with people we love of all different backgrounds, all different kind of cultures. Learn about alternative religions. Learn, learn about new ways to do things. Travel, right? In the age of liberalism, there were no such things as passports, you know? Huh. All right, so let's let's spend the last portion okay. here on, on just these last five years, really here in America. Because yeah. I remember just even, it doesn't have to be the last five years, but let's say even three years ago, just at sort of the emergence of Trump as a candidate, when people started saying the phrase alt-right. Yeah. And I did a bunch of videos on it where I was basically saying I see two strains to this thing. And people are now using this video against me. And what I saw was... There was the sort of fun meme makers and the all of the people who were having fun online, doing often doing awful things and, mm -hmm. and Nazi imagery just to, to, to upset people in power and sure. whatever, but sometimes very fun things too and funny things. But I saw like just the real sort of shit posters as they're known and the Pepe people, yeah. the whole idea was we could get, we could start sending a frog to some like intellectual and they're gonna think that's a racist thing and then they would they right. would say, I'm being under attack from racists. Like, <laughs> they would actually give them exactly what they wanted. Yeah. So I saw this, this sort of fun shit posting, whatever part of it. Not to say it didn't have elements I didn't like, but there were, I saw that as the bulk of it. And then alongside of that was this that yes. you're talking about, yes. the identitarian part, the true racist part, the part that had been sort of underground for a long time and then because of social media now was finding that it could actually influence people and be yeah. powerful. Okay, so those, and now, and you know, and I think the media really fueled both of those things because basically when Hillary said that deplorables comment, mm -hmm. she, she just lumped the whole damn thing together. And I think if she had not said that, I think it's very possible she'd be president. Well, she, right helped, now and, she helped the cause. She almost made the alt-right exist. But yeah. you know, I, so was, but yeah. my question really is, how would you just define the alt-right? Flat out, if I asked you right now, because I think the definition has changed it a little has. bit. But if I ask you right now, in, in the summer of 2018, yeah. what the definition of well, alt-right so You know, the, the, the phrase alt-right comes about, what, 10 years ago. I think it was coined by, by Paul Gottfried, who himself is a follower of uh, Carl Schmitt. Um, I, I would rather look at this uh, as, a, as, a, as a right Hegelian collectivist movement, you know, in, in general, that stretches from the early 19th century all the way up to the present, that's, def that's characterized by a love of dictatorship, a love of power, protectionist trade policy, nativist immigration policy, and, and, and a resentment against commercial life because, it's, because it's, it's, it's too heterogeneous and too ennobling of humanity. I mean, that, to, to me, the alt-right is one species, I guess you could say, one flavoring, one instantiation of a much larger problem that stretches way back, which is an illiberal theory of, of life, an illiberal theory of, of, um, of, of politics. So that's, I think, the right way to think about it. I and mean, the first time I heard Trump speak was July 2015, and, and I don't even think we were using the term alt-right at the time. Mm -hmm. But he opened his speech with 
um, the immigrants are a problem. I thought, hmm. Then it was protection, the foreign goods, protections, we need protections. And I thought, hmm. And his third big point was, I can fix everything. I thought, hmm. This is all sounding strangely familiar to me, you know? That's, that's like the three pillars of, of right Hegelian ideology, essentially. And um, I realized we had a problem. And I understand, I do, why people had a high regard for him. He was going to save us from, from the problems that Obama had created. And God knows those problems. And, and the left has gotten just bonkers, right? So we need, we need protection from that. But he introduced his own form of problems. And he unleashed its own form of, of dangers and, and potential, potentially very despotic uh, arrangements of power. And in some ways, they're more insidious because they appeal to the bourgeoisie. The left has always been a little bit culturally estranged, you know, from, from the mainstream of American life. Whereas Trump connects very closely with it. This is why fascist movements have been oftentimes much more successful than, than left socialist ones. Wait, I gotta, I gotta get this, because I would have thought the opposite. So if you, if you would have asked me before you said that, I would say the left is the one that has understood the, the culture part of this, at mm. least in the American uh, piece of it. Certainly academia and yeah. culture, what, what you could and couldn't joke well, sure, about. Sure, 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 but that's high those, culture. Yeah. The left is, as, as Hayek said, you know, I mean, socialist ideology never came from below. It was never mm -hmm. working man's philosophy. It was always an It was always the intellectuals. It was a top-down rule. Mm -hmm. It was always the ruling class that hatched socialist ideology. There never would have been communism, socialism, all these things without the intellectual class. But f f fascism, if you'll allow me to use that term, uh, kind of flips the narrative a little bit. It's more. It's much more of a, a from below. Mm -hmm. It's you can keep your religion. You can keep your nationhood, your identity, your race, your language, rally around your friends, uh, your family, you know, all the things that you believe are true you. And, 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 and within me as a person, as a leader, I will, I will embody all your values and, and collectivize us in a way that, that means something important, that, that connects with who you are. So in that sense, it's, it's a very effective um, way of being illiberal. All right, so all that said, what is our way out of this precarious position? I, I, I think I get what you're, yeah. the, I get the theme of what you're doing here, I, of is we have to just keep fighting for what we believe think, in and, and, also and be think, better. Well, so Dave, I think we need to rethink who we are. I think we need to deepen and enrich our understanding of who we are and what we're here to do. And it goes back centuries. I mean, it was the liberalism that dug us out of feudalism that ended the guilds, that brought us free trade, that ended slavery, that really gave birth to the modern world. And we need to learn to take credit for that and make that ethos our ethos. Uh, go back and read the works of, of Adam Smith and the great Scottish, Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, you know, and, and understand our history so we understand ourselves better. I think this is important because we need to stop thinking of ourselves, even though we are radicals, I think you are, I think I am. <laughs> Well, I almost believe that we should stop thinking of ourselves that way. We should think of ourselves as normal. <laughs> if, if I'm a radical, then the phrase radical, it's definitely not as cool as it used to be. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm open to these ideas, and yeah. I, want, I guess being, being open right now and being, yeah. li being really living up to the ideals that you've set forth here yes. is radical these days. It, it kind and, of is, and maybe liberalism has always been a radical creed because it opposes power. It always has been opposed to power. And that's what we have to do now, but we also have to celebrate regular life. You know, we have to, we have to celebrate the, the good life and the beautiful things and the things we love, the people we love and the choices that we can make and the technologies we can use. And I, I fall in love with the new technology every single day. I came over, with, <laughs> I came over to see with this new funny pillow that I bought for ten dollars on Amazon, it allows me to sleep sitting straight up, and I'm enraptured by yeah. that. I think this is the way to happiness, and I think ultimately it's the path to, to political victory for us too. To be to be more hopeful, to be more cheerful, to be more to celebrate life, and celebrate love, and celebrate wealth in a way in which neither the left or the right are doing right now. It gives us an, an opening to be awesome to emancipate the world. We can do this. I got nothing better to do. <laughs> For more on Jeffrey, follow him on Twitter, Jeffrey A. Tucker.